Good morning. Uh, we start this morning with general questions. Our first question is from Alex Rowley. President officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress is, has been made in addressing the deficit that was built into Fife and Health and Social Care Partnership when it was established. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, the opening budget deficit dating from the establishment of the IJB in 2016-17 has reduced to just under £9 million since that time. Further progress will be made on this over the coming year. This is a deficit which needs to be addressed by NHS Fife and Fife Council. And together with COSLA, we are engaging with them and the IJB to support their plans to sy systematically reduce the deficit without reducing capacity by redesigning services and delivery and investing in quality, sustainable care. Alex Rowley. I really say to the Health Secretary that that is not an acceptable position for us to be in. Uh, the bottom line is that the Chief Executive of NHS Fife wrote to me just last week and he says, as, and I quote, as we move into 2019-20, the budget position remains challenging with an estimated £15 million budget gap. They've had to bail out the IGB in this current year and that's on top of this deficit that they started with. And the only answer the Scottish Government seems to have is that NHS Fife and Fife Council will instruct the IGB to cut services. Does she not realise that they are struggling to deliver services? And will she commit to meet with the co-leaders of Fife Council, who I spoke to this morning, and confirm this to be the case? The Secretary. Well, that's a bit ironic, presiding officer, because this is a deficit that Fife Council and NHS Fife bequeathed to this IJB before it even started. So absolutely it is not acceptable, but if you really want to start changing this, Mr Rowley, then you need to talk to Fife Council and get them to come on board with the work that COSLA and I are trying to do with them and NHS Fife in order to address the deficit that they gave to that IJB. And so they're not bailing out the IJB, what they're actually doing is being forced in a really perverse way to address a deficit that they bequeathed in the first place. What we're trying to do is get them, is get them to stop telling the IJB to cut services, recognise that the IJB has the statutory responsibility and therefore the decision-making power for commissioning and planning those services, use the funding that both the NHS Fife and the Council have, including the additional funding for uh, integrated joint uh, services, to plan systematically to reduce what remains of that legacy deficit over a period of years say, let's say, the three years that I have given uh, health boards to plan their finances and allow the IJB to work within the budget it's got without trying to repay a debt that belongs actually to NHS Fife and, NH and uh, Fife Council in the first place. Alexander Stewart, be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. With Fife Health and Social Care Partnership looking to tackle the budget gap, daycare services and care home closures are being considered. How will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that vital care for the elderly in the area will not be seriously affected? Cabinet Secretary. Well, you know, we're having a bit of an irony bypass this morning because can I rem remind the member that actually the additional funds to NHS uh, Scotland, to our local authorities, and including an additional 160 million for integrated health and social care are funds that he and his party sitting over there voted against. Yes. However, even nonetheless, nonetheless, on these benches, we take our responsibilities seriously, even if our Scottish Conservative colleagues do not. So what we are doing is directly, my officials, COSLA officials, are engaging directly with the Council, with the Health Board and with the IJB to resolve this legacy debt bequeathed to the IJB without reducing capacity and cutting services. So that is what we are doing, and it would be very helpful to have members across this chamber engage with us in supporting that in whatever manner they might wish to, rather than trying to score cheap political points off the back of it. Mark Ruskell. Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the redesign of GP out of hours services currently underway by the Fife Health and Social Care Partnership as a new multidisciplinary model that's emerging which could save the services that we've all been fighting for, but it will require additional resources. 
So will she commit to providing additional funding for training prescribing pharmacists and advanced nurse practitioners to deliver this new modern model for out-of-hours delivery across Fife? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Mr Ruskell for uh, that contribution. I am aware uh, of the proposals that are in hand. We do have uh, additional funds available to help uh, both prescribing nurses and uh, pharmacists in these matters, and we'll look at that proposal wh when it comes to me specifically. Question number two, Sandra White. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the DWP regarding progress with changing the state pension age for women in Scotland born in the 1950s. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. We have raised this issue with the UK Government on numerous occasions and made clear our position that it should take responsibility for the mishandling of this policy and provide transitional protection for those affected. These women have been badly let down by the UK Government and it is disappointing that, despite the overwhelming evidence of the devastating impact these changes have had, nothing has changed at the UK Government level. It is time for the UK Government to accept their responsibility for the hardship they have created. Sandra White. I thank the Minister for that response. Uh, there obviously has been changes uh, coming across. In light of the UK Government's punitive changes, which I've just mentioned, to pension credit, whilst baby women are again being penalised, can I ask the Minister to call on the UK Government to put in place fair transitional state pension arrangements and halt the reforms to pension credit, which will hit those who are most in need? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, in February, I wrote to the Pensions Minister about the recent changes to pension credit eligibility, and I urged him to consider the impact of these changes, particularly on WASPy women, who are part of a mixed-age couple and who will now find themselves doubly disadvantaged because of the UK government policies. He did not address my points regarding the plight of the WASPy women in his reply, and we will continue to raise these issues with the UK government. The strength of support from all parties, with the exception of the Scottish Tories, was evident in last night's members' debate led by Sandra White, and I would commend Sandra White and others involved in the cross-party group for their continued support of the WASPy women in their fight for justice. Question number three, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it can do to help NHS Ayrshire and Arne reduce waiting times for treatment for mental health problems. Minister Clare Hockey. Since 2016, the Scottish Government has invested £1.8 million in NHS Ayrshire and Arne for capacity building and workforce development to improve mental health waiting times, with over £770,000 to come. This funding is currently paying for 8.8 .8 whole time equivalent staff with another in recruitment. Alongside this, the board is receiving support from the Mental Health Access Improvement Team to deliver frontline improvement projects to improve access to treatment. The Scottish Government is also investing an additional £4 million in CAM staff across Scotland who will be instrumental in supporting new services and reducing pressure on the system. John Scott. I thank the Minister for her answer and she will be aware of the difficulties in accessing the CAM service, particularly in South Ayrshire, as well as the long waiting time for an appointment with a consultant psychiatrist. And she will know suicide numbers are rising, particularly in young men, but across all age groups, regrettably, with loneliness and isolation on the increase. What additional measures can the Scottish Government take to address these growing problems? Minister. Uh, I thank Mr Scott for his answer. He, he might be interested to know that the latest figures show that NHS Ayrshire and Arne, 95% uh, of CAMs and 82% of psychological therapies patients were seen within 18 weeks, with an average wait of seven weeks and five weeks respectively. However, the Scottish Government recognised that some people are still waiting too long and we are determined to meet the waiting time standards across Scotland. And that's why we set up a new mental health delivery board, which I chair. It had its second meeting this week and this will oversee improvement and activity and track performance. Boards have been asked to put in place improvement plans by April, setting out clear milestones over the next two years. Monica Lennon. Thank you. The Minister will be aware that Labour-led North Ayrshire Council is the first local authority in Scotland to have a dedicated mental health counsellor in each of its secondary schools. But the leader of the council, Councillor Joe Cullinan, has told me that demand for the service is so high that some schools already have waiting lists and he's raised the issue of support out with the school day. What action will the, the Minister take to ensure that every secondary school in Scotland has the dedicated mental health counsellor like North Ayrshire? And what resources are available to make sure that the service is sufficiently resourced and that support doesn't end at the, the end of the school day? Minister. 
Uh, um, Monica Lennon, thank you very much for that question. You'll be aware that we have committed to uh, school councillors in every high school across Scotland. We have also, as I said in my previous answer, as Mr Scott, invested £4 million in CAMS, which will uh, deliver 80 additional staff, which will ease pressure across the system across the country. We've also committed to 250 additional school nurses and to rolling out mental health first aid training for teachers across all local authorities. And these measures, I believe, will help to ease um, some of the concerns that she has raised across Scotland, not just in Asia. Thank you. Question number four, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, Singh Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to Silver Line Care Caledonia, de-recognising GMB Scotland as a trade union representing the staff in six of its care homes. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government's Fair Work Action Plan recognises the important role of trade unions and we are committed to supporting strong trade unions for the benefit of workers and our economy. It is therefore regrettable when an employer chooses to de-recognise a union. I would strongly urge both parties in this case to come together to reach an agreement. Jim McMillan. I thank the Minister for that reply. Does the Minister consider that the decision is concerning, it's a concerning development at a time when care home staff across Scotland may actually feel undervalued despite, despite providing some of the most valuable services in society? Minister. Well, let, let me uh, agree with uh, Stuart McMillan, our care uh, home workers uh, and our uh, social care workers more generally uh, provide a, an essential service. I think that should be a very strong message from this place that we recognise uh, their great value to our economy, to our society. In relation to the specific uh, circumstances, uh, you know, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport is aware of the situation, closely monitoring uh, the situation. We will uh, be willing to offer any support required, but the uh, matter is being dealt with by ACAS right at this moment in time, and I would reiterate my message that we would strongly urge both parties in this situation to come together to reach an agreement through ACAS if necessary. And Neil Finlay. The de-recognition of the GMB at Silverline comes on the back of de-recognition of Unison at Cornerstone. Uh, this appears to be a deliberate anti-union stance that's emerging in the care sector. Um, so what is the government doing to stop this becoming a growing phenomenon in the care sector? And has the minister met with the companies and the trade unions concerned to try and end uh, this de-recognition de movement? Minister. Uh, I haven't uh, at this stage. Uh, I will be uh, willing to do so as is necessary. As I say, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport is monitoring the situation. Clearly, it would be preferable if the parties could come together to resolve it. If uh, it requires our further uh, involvement, then we will, of course, consider that. Uh, ACAS are actively involved, and I hope both parties can come to an agreement and can come to an arrangement. But I would reiterate the point that I made. We greatly value the work of the trade unions. We are working with trade unions, and I consider it a matter of the utmost regret in any circumstances where an employer actively de-recognises a trade union. Question number five, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it plans to take to re-engage the Rural GP Association with its remote and rural general practice working group. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, the Rural Group Chair, Sir Lewis Ritchie, met with the new chair of the Remote and Rural GPs Association on the 3rd of April. I understand the meeting was productive for all involved. Sir Lewis has acknowledged the concerns raised by RG Pass members and has agreed to hold further discussions in due course towards their continuing involvement in implementing the contract in our remote and rural communities. I have had discussions myself with Sir Lewis at, uh, just as recently as last week and we'll continue to keep in touch with them uh, as this progresses. Gail Ross. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Indeed, it's very welcome to hear. But there is a perception that tangible progress is not being made in the Short Life Working Group. Will the Scottish Government commit to taking this feedback into account and refreshing the aims and objectives of the group with a view to reflecting the desire for the group to be more proactive? Cabinet Secretary. I'm grateful to uh, Ms Ross for that additional question. I am aware of that perception. Uh, I don't think it's entirely fair, but nonetheless, it needs to be taken seriously. And indeed, that was part of the discussion that I had with Sir Lewis. Uh, we'll, we will now take that feedback very seriously indeed, continue those discussions <coughs> and look to see what more can be done so that the group can uh, become uh, more proactive in the work that we need it to take forward. 
Miles Briggs, followed by Rudy Thank Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and I agree with uh, Gail Ross's sentiments there, because as much as the Cabinet Secretary tries to dress this up, the Association of Rural GPs resigned because of a due to the lack of progress actually being made to take on board rural GPs' concerns. So I ca can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, will she agree to meet with a cross-party delegation on this to take forward these real concerns to make sure we get this GP contract right for every community in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it would be very helpful if we uh, wait to see how uh, Sir Lewis's discussions with uh, the new chair of that group progress, uh, but uh, following that, and that should be uh, in a very short timescale because I'm keen that we do make progress on this and that we continue to engage uh, that uh, particular association in this work. So within very short timescale of understanding how that progress has been made, then I'm very content to meet with members uh, to see what more might be done. And Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure that the R Rural GPs Association will re-engage if they are clear that their concerns are being heard and acted on, because there is real concerns about the contract. It flies in the face of health inequalities, and it certainly doesn't value the work of rural GPs. It also lacks oversight by the Technical Advisory Group on Resource Allocation. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary if she will make sure that oversight is in place so that the contract can be in keeping with other health services. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to uh, Ms Grant uh, for that. Of course, we do continue to have oversight, but I do think it is worth just noting for the record and also for members' information, this isn't a GP contract that the Scottish Government imposed on GPs. This is a contract that was negotiated and agreed with the BMA GP group. So a significant number, in fact, a majority of GPs across the country voted for that contract and are already working it and seeing the benefit of it, including GPs in remote and rural practices. Nonetheless, there are additional concerns and we are attempting to address those. And I'm very happy to keep members up to date with the progress we make in that regard. Question number six, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of the birth rate falling to its lowest level since records began in 1855, whether it will provide details of the steps that it will take to support people to have children, including supporting existing families to have more children. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Deciding when and indeed if to have children is a matter of personal choice. The Scottish Government is working hard to create a country that is the best place in the world to grow up through a variety of initiatives aimed at supporting pregnant women, children and families. Our targeted support provided to families includes our Best Start Pregnancy and Baby Payments, which have already awarded more than £2.7 million, the provision of universal free school meals for every child in P1 to 3, and a school clothing grant supporting approximately 120,000 children. We have also funded 600 hours of early learning entitlement for all three- and four-year-olds and eligible two-year-olds, rising to 1140 um, hours from August 2020, and more than 80,000 baby boxes have been given to new parents across Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In the, in the 20th century, Scotland's population growth was the lowest on earth, and last year our birth rate was a feeble 9.2 per thousand people, well below placement level. By contrast, our northern neighbour, the Faroe Islands, had a fertility of a rate of 2.4 children, born to each woman, one of the healthiest in Europe. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with the Scottish Government's own expert advisory group on migration and population? The immigration alone cannot address regional or local de depopulation and sustain communities. And therefore, what will the Scottish Government do to research the barriers to Scots having children? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the decreasing birth rate is not new, nor is it unique to Scotland. A recent report from the National Records of Scotland uh, suggested that some of the reasons behind this may be women uh, may be postponing child childbearing to later ages and the economic uncertainty influencing decisions around childbearing. That's why the government um, is doing what it can to help overcome some of these uncertainties and has introduced a raft of new financial supports, some of which I outlined in my earlier answer. We're also taking a wide-ranging action across government portfolios to tackle poverty by increasing income for work and earning, reducing household costs and maximising income from social security and benefits in kind. This is to ensure that Scotland is not only the best place to grow up, but also the best place to have children. And question seven, Donald Cameron. The Scottish Government, what action it is taking to support GP, GP practices in rural areas? Cabinet Secretary, Jean Freeman. 
Uh, GPs in rural communities do face distinct challenges, so our 2018-19 uh, package of support that we put in place included uh, financial support for uh, recruitment incentives, uh, financial support for relocation costs for GPs moving to rural posts, uh, support for the Scottish Rural Medical Collaborative to develop recruitment and sustainability measures, including the £20,000 GP for GP scheme, uh, support for GP recruitment and resilience schemes in the Highlands and Islands, uh, additional support, half a million pounds, to support rural dispensing practices, and £150,000 to support IT improvements to rural health boards. Donald Cameron. Uh, a recent survey of rural GPs showed that 82% of its members believe that outlook, the outlook for rural health care is worse under the new contract, and 92% of its members would reject the contract if given an opportunity to vote now. So what reassurance can the Cabinet Secretary give to rural GPs who are clearly desperate and feel their voices are being ignored by her government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, given that that contract was negotiated with the BMA and was... Uh, passed by GPs, including GPs in rural communities, and it is always worth making that point. This is not a contract that this government imposed on GPs. Nonetheless, we are continuing to work with the BMA, who also need to take account of some of those concerns. Working with them, I met them in fact only yesterday, to discuss what more we might do in, in terms of phase two of the contract, but also, as I said earlier to my colleague Gail Ross, some of the work that we're taking forward with Sir Lewis Ritchie to take account of those concerns in order to be able to specifically address them in addition to that substantive package of comprehensive support that I outlined.